Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, on Roku Dwyer Boxing News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Today is June the 14th, 2013. There is a very important article, in my opinion, today on a great website, BoxingScene.com. After fights, often the guy who's lost the fight will have complaints, and the public, right, and the media will kind of disregard the complaints because, of course, the guy has lost the fight and might be trying to save face, might be trying to come up with some explanation as to why he lost because, of course, he couldn't have actually been beaten in the fight. Right? We understand fighters have egos, but it's rare when a winner of a fight comes forward after the fight and says, you know what, something was not right here. Someone told me things that were not true. Well, that's what has happened following Arislandi Lara's victory over Alfredo Angulo. Now, people need to realize that boxing has a lot of issues, right? But there is a whole host of problems that don't involve loaded gloves and obvious steroid use, right? These problems happen the night of the fight and can easily impact the fight. We all need to know about it. Arislandi Lara, who's big, by his own admission, for a junior middleweight. He's big for 154, right? He was told that neither fighter could weigh in at more than 10 pounds above the weight class on fight night, right? So he and his corner made sure that they came in weighing 164 pounds or less. Of course, they show up on fight night and hear that Alfredo Angulo on fight night weighed 174 pounds. So, of course, after the fight took place, they weren't happy. They went back and looked through the contract. And, of course, nowhere in the contract does it have that 164-pound weight limit, right? So it's clear that someone involved in the promotion put a weight limit on the Lara camp that did not exist for Alfredo Angulo. Now, Lara went on to win the fight, right? Angulo quit after curiously claiming he was thumbed by thumbless gloves, right? Think about that. But it's a bit disconcerting to hear the winner say after the fight that they weren't given the same advantages as the opponent right it's a must read I really encourage everyone to read it you're hearing from a great source in the piece you're hearing from Arislandi Lara himself right let me go further let's talk about some other situations that happen that may have slipped below radar. One of the more outrageous ones to me is David Hay's claim, and I believe David Hay, that they had mapped out a route by which Hay was to enter the ring when he fought Vladimir Klitschko in rainy conditions, right? The route that they had mapped out was supposed to be a straighter line to the ring, right, was supposed to help the fighter stay dry. Keep in mind, it was rainy. You don't want slippery shoes, right? And, of course, was supposed to insulate David Hay from most of the crowd. In other words, a fighter has a lot, as you can imagine, on his mind as he enters the ring, and he wants a route where the crowd's not right on him. He's able to stay dry. He's able to get into the ring quickly. So David Hay, in a heavyweight unification match, comes out of the locker room 
Uh, if there's ever a time where a fighter should have the stature of actually um, being told the truth and actually having a straight line to the ring, it would be in a championship unification match. David Hay at that time held a share of the belt. So he comes out of the locker room. He's about to enter the ring, and you know the rest. They had lied to him. He had to take a long route into the ring, and of course it was a wet route. He was prepared for it. He actually had plastic over his shoes, but it was a wet route, and of course the crowd was right on him. So he wasn't able to just fixate on the fight. He had to look friendly to the crowd. He had to devote a portion of his energy to dealing with the crowd in Germany on his way to the ring. They had lied to him, right? And of course, the lie is set up in such a way that he really can't do anything about it. The crowd's waited. He's on his way into the ring. And of course, now he has to take the long route, right? And, you know, devote energy to that. Of course, another way fighters cut corners is to keep you waiting in the ring, right? You're the first to enter. You're in the ring. You're ready to fight. You're ready to go. Then, of course, the other guy who already has his hands wrapped, who already had a robe on, who's not supposed to keep you waiting, of course, has you waiting in the ring some inordinate amount of time, right? All of these things happen in boxing. Now, let me name a couple of fights. You can check here on YouTube, Google not just a fight video. What I want you to do is to actually also Google the comments of the fighters. Right now, last year we had a complete farce. The Sonny Bill Williams, Francois Botha fight that took place where Botha was led to believe the fight was a 12 round fight for some interim belt. You know the rest. Botha is pacing himself for a 12-round fight. He's the older fighter. He wants to make sure he has energy in rounds 11 and 12. So, of course, Botha, in round 9, starts to land. Sonny Bill Williams is dead tired. He looks like he's in jeopardy. Looks like he has nothing left. Then, of course, they announce over the loudspeaker that the next round, the 10th round, is the last round of the fight. Right? Fight goes the distance. Both, of course, who was fighting a 12 round fight, has the fight stopped at the end of 10 rounds, doesn't even get a chance to use the gas left in the tank, doesn't even get a chance to finish an opponent that he was in the process of finishing. Well, if you think that fight is ridiculous, I want you to look at the video of the Danny Williams Constantine Erich fight. This is on film, folks. In the sixth round of that fight, about a minute in, Danny Williams has Erich in all kinds of trouble. He's about to end the fight. Erich is literally one or two punches away from being knocked out. When curiously, something like one and a half minutes into the three-minute round, the bell sounds to end the round, right? Ludicrous. This stuff isn't mythology. This stuff actually happens. Let me name one more fight, right? And as fight fans, we need to keep vigilant about this stuff. We need to let the sport know we're going to throw a red flag from the stands if any of this stuff happens. Now, Michael Cox is Manny Pacquiao's advisor. In other words, this is a very high-ranking guy in boxing circles, right? He actually helps several fighters, including, obviously, some of the best known in the sport. Well, he's actually an advisor for Riddell Mayo, right, who was supposed to fight Tyson Marquez in a fight that was scheduled to go at 112 pounds. That's the weight class, right? Let me just read a quote from Michael Kahn's about hijinks that happened at the weigh-in. Understand, these weigh-ins have problems. You've had fighters like Roy Jones actually admit 
to having things in their pockets at the weigh-in just so they can look heavier than they are. Well, here's Michael Kantz's comments on this male weigh-in at which he decided not to have his fighter go forward with the fight. Here's the quote. I don't believe he's 112 pounds, meaning Marquez, right? Mayo came in right on 112 pounds. Then Marquez came on and had about 30 guys with him. I complained to the WBA's representative and to the commission that he doesn't need that many guys on stage. They didn't listen to me. Then he's on the scale. And then one of the commission guys says he's overweight by one kilo. By the way, that's about two pounds, right? Then seconds later, he stepped on the scale again, and I told them that I can see that his feet are hanging halfway over the front of the scale. The towel is pulling on the front of the scale. And they said that he was still overweight, right? The one commissioner told the other commission guys to get out of the way. He came on a third time. I told them his feet are hanging off again. Then came the fourth time, and they said he made weight. So what happened to the one kilo he was over? This all transpired in two and a half to three minutes. I complained to the WBA's guy that there were too many guys on the stage and the towel was pulling on the scale and there were guys behind him touching him and stuff. I talked to the commission. I wanted everyone off the stage. Bring back the fighter plus two and have him make weight. They said it's too late. He already drank water. Right. Think about it. All I'm saying is, um, as you watch these fight promotions, I encourage everyone to read post-fight comments from both camps, like the comments posted on BoxingScene.com today concerning Arislandi Lara's concern over how this fight was conducted. He's upset. He should be. If the other side was allowed to weigh in more than him. Let's take this a little bit further. Just imagine if Lara had lost the fight. Just imagine if he said, hey, I had heard we couldn't come in at more than 164. Who would listen to him? He would just be viewed as a fighter with sour grapes. He would be taken about as seriously as Alfredo Angulo is being taken for his comments about being thumbed in the fight. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. I encourage you to Google all of the fights I've mentioned here. Simply put, they are all outrageous. And understand, this stuff isn't, you know, boxing folklore. This stuff isn't stuff that is alleged to have happened 10 odd years ago. This is all stuff that has happened recently. And keep in mind, what makes this Michael Kant story? even more upsetting is the fact that this was a commission-based fight with commission representatives present, such as the sport of boxing. Let me hear from you. Thanks for watching.